the Spirit of God is with you and also with you. Welcome to this virtual gathering of Washington Avenue Christian Church. My name is Nathan Russell, and my pronouns are he and him, and I serve this congregation as its senior pastor. Truly, it is a good and joy-filled thing to be with you as we worship God together from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. As you have noticed, we are worshiping online only today. This past week, we've had seven confirmed cases of COVID from persons who worshiped with us one week ago. We are still within the incubation period from possible exposure from last Sunday. So if you were with us last week and happened to test positive on or before Wednesday of this week, please let the church office know so that we can engage in contact tracing. Your chair of the board, your chair of the elders, and I will make a decision about worshiping in person or online only for July 3rd, no later than Wednesday of this coming week. Thank you, dear church, for all the ways in which you lean into these covenants with God, church, and neighbor. Leading us in worship today are Evan Collins, Director of Worship and the Arts, Marty Rowe, worship leader, and Janet Stevens-Brown, elder at the table. You can download today's worship guide by visiting the link in the below video description. When we come to our time of prayer, I'll mention only the first names of those who are on our prayer list. If you would like to add to our prayer list, there is a link in the below video description that opens a website on which you can submit one. During the offertory, you may give online, and as with the prayer request, there is a link in the below video description that opens our online giving portal. Our special offering for the month of June is for the operating expenses of Camp Christian, which, by the way, has an excellent summer and year of gatherings and events planned. Throughout Evan's offering uh, offering meditation, I encourage you to reflect on God's manifold gifts and myriad blessings. On the top left-hand side of your screen and on the back cover of the worship guide is a QR code. You can scan this code with a smart device and a website will open on which you can do three different things. First, register your attendance. Second, submit a prayer request. And third, give online. Since we are worshiping online today, I hope you have elements for communion at your tables at home, your sanctuaries, and sacred spaces. Our upcoming events for this week are listed on the back cover of the worship guide. And as you know, we were supposed to have a congregational meeting this morning following worship to elect officers for the coming, upcoming year. This vote is now taking place online. By this point, members should have received an email from Chair of the Board, Mark Mathis. That email includes a link on which you can register your vote. For those without email access, we will be mailing paper ballots this week. If you have an email address and have not received an email from Mark, please get in touch with me as soon as possible. As always, our social media accounts are active, so I encourage you to interact with us in multiple ways at W-A-C-C-E-L-Y-R-I-A. Beloved of God, today is the third Sunday after Pentecost. Though we are physically scattered, we are virtually and spiritually gathered. We are living stones who are being built into a spiritual house. Our worship of God is about to begin. So, dear friends, I say to you, wherever you may be, Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord.
who gathers us in myriad ways. We didn't expect to be online only again. COVID has hit us and we are grieved for those who are sick and saddened that we cannot be together. After the week just passed, we need the fellowship of our church. And yet, part of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ is that you meet us wherever we are and hold us together, even when we are physically apart. Send your Holy Spirit everywhere people worship you. May she liberate us to be living stones that raise a temple in which your love for the whole wide world is proclaimed with reckless abandon. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the cornerstone of our faith. Amen. to this time of prayer, we petition the God of blessing to help us seek the peace of God's shalom. In particular, we name what is so obvious to us that we are not able to gather in person as we would like, 
and many in our community are suffering from COVID-19. We've also had a heck of a week in our country as decisions from the Supreme Court of the United States have been handed down, opening up guns to even more people and restricting reproductive health care. All the more reason we come to pray to God and ask that God help us seek the peace of God's shalom. We also hold these persons deep within our hearts as we speak their names to the very heart of God. Alan, Barb and Rodney, Bill, Carol, Craig, Dan, Debbie, Diane and Dennis, Dawn, Dory, Doug, Katie and family, the city of Illyria, Gail, Jackie, Jacqueline, Jean, Jeff, Jim and Rosalie, John and Ava, Joshua, Judy, Julie and Tim, Kathy and Mark, Kay, Keith, Leone, Linda, Lori, Louise, Marcia, Mark, Mary Lou, Patty and Ken, Paul, Phyllis, Robin, Shirley, Steve, Tyson, the people of Ukraine and Russia, Vincent, Vivian, and Wes. We also extend our deepest sympathies to the family of Robin. Let us join our hearts together as we go now to God in prayer. Holy God, our hearts are heavy. We need your presence with us. We need to trust that you hear this petition because you are the healer of our every ill, the light of each tomorrow. Give us grace beyond our fear and hope beyond our sorrow. God of blessing, help us seek the peace of your shalom. Healing God, we pray for those who are sick, those who are recovering, those who are hospitalized, for all who suffer with any disease or dis-ease. Grant them your healing presence, we pray. God of blessing, help us seek the peace of your shalom. Holy One, if you have been paying attention to what's been going on in our country, we are a hot mess right now. Supreme Court decisions have been, have been handed down, and they leave us terrified. Help us to be agents of change, people who are being built into your house. Help us to be holy priests that enact your justice and joy, peace and shalom from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. God of blessing, help us seek the peace of your shalom. We give you thanks, O oh God, that even though we cannot be together as we would like, your spirit knows no boundaries. She will meet us wherever we are. We thank you, too, that over the past two and a half years, that we know how to pivot when necessary. Your grace has accompanied us along the way, 
And for that, we give you thanks. Be with our physically scattered, yet spiritually gathered church. God of blessing, help us seek the peace of your shalom. We want nothing more, O God, than to be agents of your justice and joy, peace and shalom from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth. We long to be the people who enact the future you want and ultimately will have here and now. This is hard work, and sometimes we can forget that you are the cornerstone, that you are the builder, and we are not. So, help us when we stumble. Let us fall upon your grace and raise us to walk in newness. Finally, grant us your spirit, and may she give us the breath to sing our prayer to you. Your gifts, your tithes and offerings, God uses them to build the future that God wants and ultimately will have and transform us too into a people who have their identity as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, agents of God's mercy. Gifts that have arrived throughout this week are represented here. And now, filled with the Spirit of God, I invite you to reflect on the joy of generous giving and faith-filled living. May we pray with one another. Holy One, you are the builder and the architect of this church. May you use these gifts and all that we have and all that we are to fashion this world into your future reign of justice and joy, peace and shalom. We make this prayer rooted in the one who is our rock and the cornerstone of our faith, Jesus the Christ. Amen.
reading from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. Listen for the word of God stirring within and beyond these words of Scripture. Come to Jesus, a living stone, although rejected by humanity, yet chosen and precious to God. And are yourselves, like living stones, being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Thus, Scripture contains the following. See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen, precious, and whoever believes in that stone will not be put to shame. To you all who believe then, a precious honor. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. They stumble over the word disobeying, disobedient by design. Yet you all are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of shadow into God's marvelous light. Once not a people but now God's people, once bereft of mercy, but now rich in mercy. For the word of God in its promise and covenant, thanks be to God. May we pray with one another. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire and lighten us with your celestial fire. For if you build us into a spiritual house, then nothing else matters. And if you do not build us into a spiritual house, then nothing else matters. Call us once again to be your people. We make this prayer in the name of your beloved Jesus the Christ, our rock and cornerstone. Amen. Let me go ahead and state the obvious as if it weren't already clear. Today's not the day we expected. And though this is the text from the Year W lectionary I had chosen, this sermon is not the one I intended to preach. So much can change within the course of a week or even just a few days. The pandemic of COVID-19, which we have navigated quite well, has visited us with its contagions. And as a result, more than 10% of our in-person congregation from last Sunday has tested positive. After mapping for contact tracing, it seems that 100% of us who were here last week have been exposed. Each weekday came with a new positive case. Friday came with two, including a hospitalization. Plus, we were supposed to have an in-person congregational meeting and our first summer Sunday, Sunday, that's with an AE, social. Add to that, It has been a hell of a week for our country, especially as the Supreme Court of the United States has handed down landmark decisions that put more guns on our streets, and they reversed a near 50-year precedent that will now limit reproductive health care. Finally, we're still working through some things as a church. May was a rough month for us. But we have prayed for each other and for our church in ways that have proven that though weeping may endure for the night, joy comes in the morning. 
But, you know, if there's any day that we needed to be together in person, to pray for health, to plead for friends, to be restored by love that never ends, well, by God, that day is today. We are physically scattered and yet virtually and spiritually gathered online. On Thursday of this past week, I spoke with my leadership coach, Dr. Barr McClure. This conversation was our first since early May. So we had much to discuss and catch up on about the status of our church, along with questions with which I'm still wrestling, pondering, and discerning. She encouraged me to be patient with what I do not yet know. She even went so far as to say that I'm in a vacuum of knowledge, which was actually quite helpful to hear. I quipped to her, Bar, you're sounding like Jesus. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. She laughed and said, well, there you have it. And I answered, yeah, you got to watch out for this Jesus. He will trip you up. A few hours after our phone conversation, I turned to today's text and read, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. The first letter to Peter isn't the first time we've heard these phrases. Psalm 118, verse 22 says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And that verse is cited in Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Acts. However, the author of this epistle combines that psalm with a text from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, which says, he will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. For both houses of Israel, he will become a rock one stumbles over, a trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Those who build, Peter says, have rejected the cornerstone, which is a stumbling block and a rock of offense. There's more to it than that. Peter says that the stumbling block is a rock of scandal in the Greek. Perhaps Peter knew what my professor of preaching, Dr. Lance Poppy, would write in his book titled, The Scandal of Having Something to Say. Dr. Poppy writes, Christian preaching is grounded in the conviction that a divine commission has authorized a most urgent, winsome, and demanding kind of talk. Such talk is not only, is not, only not warranted to the satisfaction of all those implicated in its claims, but unwarrantable according to any generally accepted public standard. It is, therefore, scandalous talk. It boldly gives offense. In other words, preaching Jesus should trip us up. When we think of Jesus and all that he said, especially his prophetic proclamations of the last being first, the first being last, the rich being poor, the poor being rich, the wise being made fools, and the fools being made wise, and that the love of God is for the whole cosmos, no exceptions. All of that is a scandal. The very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ is always a scandal, and it will trip us up when we least expect it. 
And yet, maybe we need to stumble upon the rock of offense and trip on Jesus so that we may fall upon the gift of grace. When we think everything is up to us, when we think the present moment is definitive, when we conclude that we are the builders of the house, here Jesus is, a rock of offense, a scandalous stone on which we stub our toes and bruise our feet. We trip ourselves up on the gospel and fall to the ground in what, I'm sure, is a most comedic routine of flailing limbs. The first letter of Peter was addressed to God's chosen strangers in the world of the diaspora. So in other words, the readers are a scattered and dispersed people who live in exile. They did not have separate buildings dedicated to Christian worship. Instead, secular shrines and temples to mythological gods were everywhere. Christian people had no installed art, no buildings, no sacred places with permanent street addresses. They lived in a culture and climate ruled by imperial political and religious power. The most they could hope for was gathering in a home where they would read a letter and sing the melodies of their faith that brought them hope. Peter's first letter was written to encourage readers to embrace their identity as Christ followers in the, in the midst of a most hostile context. The author encourages everyone to understand who they are in relationship to the God who makes covenant. Finally, the apostle wants his hearers to remain faithful to Christ in the face of immense pressures to conform to the political and religious empires of the world. Make no mistake, beloved, there's a lot going on here. Or there, and the stakes are high. Come to think of it, the stakes are no less high for us today. Just like the earliest readers of First Peter, we too live in a time of imperial, political, and religious power. Just this week, the Supreme Court of the United States struck down New York's concealed carry gun law. For context, we should remember that just six weeks ago, there was a mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, that killed 10 people. Though I cannot speak for you, I do not want to live in a world where people are packing heat. Firearms for sport and hunting are just fine. But more guns in the hands of more people make us less safe. There is no question about it. And then on Friday, a majority of the Supreme Court justices struck down Roe versus Wade, overturning 50 years of judicial precedent and what some justices testified under oath was settled law. Is abortion a complex and complicated issue? Absolutely. All the more reason, then, that reproductive health decisions should be between a person and their medical provider. As the honorable senator from Georgia, the, Raff, the Reverend Raphael Warnock said, as a pro-choice pastor, I've always believed that a patient's room is way too small for a client, her doctor, and the United States government. 
One Supreme Court justice argued that the court should reconsider its past rulings, codifying rights to contraception, access, same-sex relationships, and same-sex marriage. Although it is notable that this Supreme Court justice did not mention the case Loving versus Virginia, a unanimous decision which struck down laws that made interracial marriage illegal. And yes, as you may have guessed, that very Supreme Court justice is himself in an interracial marriage. How convenient. These are the events of just this past week, which is to say nothing of the pandemic we're still navigating, the hearings about the riot of domestic terrorism enacted upon the capital of the United States on January 6th, open carry and teacher carry in Ohio, the opioid epidemic, inflation and economic uncertainty. With each passing day, I feel that we are living, as Peter said, as strangers in the world of the diaspora, a most grand and awful time. On this day, when we cannot physically gather as we would like, Perhaps we need to hear once again the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. We are ourselves like living stones being built into a spiritual house. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that has no official flag or language. We are God's own possession in order that we may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called us out of shadow into God's marvelous light. Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we were bereft of mercy, but now we are rich in mercy. Such a proclamation, however, is likely to give offense. We will be scandalized at this stone. It can and will trip us up. But to trip up on the gospel means that we fall upon grace and are raised by God to be built into what we are not yet, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. At the beginning of today's reading, Peter makes an invitation, sort of. Y'all come to Jesus, a living stone, he says. And that's, True, in part. However, the imperative command of y'all come to Jesus is not our decision alone, but a persuasive lure from the divine. Yes, I do trust that there is a decision on the part of the community, but Jesus, he has an agenda. He has in mind the future God wants and ultimately will have. We, too, are like living stones, Peter says, and we are being built. Peter does not say that we build. We are not the actors here. We are not the ones who are doing the action of construction, of building. In fact, we even have a caution from Peter. He recalls the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Nowhere in this text are we to be builders. Instead, we are being built. Perhaps the rejection of which the psalmist and now Peter speaks is that people have assumed the role of God and rejected an understanding of their identity as living stones. To reject the chief cornerstone is to make a conscious decision that we 
not God, are the builders. The constant temptation is for us to act in place of God as builders to construct something we can see rather than be patient for God to fashion us into something that transcends sight itself. We are living stones. We are not the architects or the contractors. God is building us into what we are not yet, a spiritual house, not a physical one, a holy priesthood. If this action doesn't trip us up, then, you know, nothing will. God is stacking, layering, positioning, building us, living stone upon living stone upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, to be a holy people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. This work of enacting God's reign of justice and joy, peace and shalom from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth, that is ours to do. We, the people who have tripped on the gospel, are now called to trip up the whole wide world with the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ as we enact God's mighty deeds of power. If, if we do this gospel work just to offend people, if we purposely set stones in front of people so that they may trip, well, we may need to think again. However, if our worship work in witness, if the act of us being built into what God would have us be causes others to trip, then we will be the people who remember, too, that we tripped on the gospel and have fallen upon the grace of God. We will do nothing less than be agents of God's grace without exception. This is too, beloved, is an example of a mighty act of God's power. We will remember that once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we were bereft of mercy, but now we are cashing in, for we are rich in mercy. May such words be said of us this day and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.
to this table, beloved, from wherever you are. It is okay if you happen to trip on your way. You will fall upon the grace of God. And even if you come to this table with a limp, you will be welcomed and wanted here by Jesus the Christ the one who is our rock and cornerstone. Here, we will taste the scandal of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. Let us join our elder in prayer. Loving God, we gather at this table, the one divine table, joyfully, and with profound gratitude for all the gifts you have given to us, especially that of your Son. Bless these elements, and in the weeks ahead, may we kneel in faith, stand with courage, wait in hope, and walk with you. Amen. On the night Jesus met with his disciples in an upper room, first washed his hands, and then looking up on the table, he found gifts of both grain and grape. And taking the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, And after giving thanks for it, said, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we feast upon the grace eternal. We taste and see that God is good. So, let all who hunger gather gladly. You are welcome and wanted here. Everything is ready.
though we are online only, we still welcome anyone who would desire to unite in fellowship with this congregation. If that is the call of God upon your heart, send me an email and we will figure out a way to do this online. Or whenever we are back in person, we invite you to come forward and acknowledge your profession of faith that Jesus is the Christ and Lord and Savior of the whole wide world. But for now, beloved, let us sing with reckless abandon our hymn of discipleship, number 273, Built on the Rock. of God, our worship is nearing its conclusion, but our participation in the mission of God, it never, ever ends. So come on, let's go from our doorsteps to the ends of the earth to make a plain declaration and a public demonstration of the very best, most beautiful gospel good news of Jesus Christ. May we remember that we are never, ever very far from God's heart. And finally, finally, may we trust with all that we have and all that we are that the future God wants and ultimately will have. It's here, it's now, even as it is still on its way, and it will you know, trip us up.
And all the people said, Amen.